The book of Esther, it's a small book, short little book, it only covers 12 years of history. It's a simple account of a woman who becomes the queen in Persia. As I said, it only covers 12 years of her life. It was written in 450 B.C. And if you're trying to get an idea of when the time period was, uh, this was written in the gap between chapter 6 and chapter 7 in the book of Ezra. That 60-year that, uh, gap period, this, this took place in that time. You know, within this book, there's probably about four main characters. Uh, of course, you have Esther, the queen, or who becomes queen. You have Mordecai. He's the one that wrote this book, and he's one of the main characters in it. Of course, the king, and then you have Haman. You know, I was uh, thinking yesterday as I was looking back over this, uh, I don't know if I've ever heard Esther preached. I've studied it in Sunday school. I can remember Haman and, and looking at those things in Sunday school. But I can't ever remember hearing it preached. And this is probably the reason. Did you know in the book of Esther, there is no direct reference of God in this book? Did you all know that? There is no direct reference of God. So I have two questions. Number one, why is it in the Bible? And number two, why in the world am I preaching it <laughs> if it has no direct reference of God? Well, uh, it does have some indirect references of God. Why is it in the Bible? Because it's inspired and God wanted it there. And uh, as we learned in class this morning, all Scripture is profitable. Uh, and why am I preaching it this morning? Uh, this was one of my personal studies and it touched my heart. And I wanted to share it with you all. The only way I know to do it is to kind of do it as an overview and to retell the story. And then there's some verses I really want to point out. But if you'll just kind of look along with me in chapter 1 of the book, if you remember, remember back to your the last time you read this book or when you looked at it in Sunday school, uh, the old queen was removed. Uh, if you remember a little bit about that story, she wouldn't uh, obey the command of the king and he had her removed. And that's about all that happens in the first chapter. Now in the second chapter is when we're introduced to Esther, and we're introduced to Mordecai. Uh, they were both Jews, although they would hide that fact from the king for quite some time. Somebody tell me, why are Jews in Persia at this point? Why would there be Jews in Persia at this point? Y'all look at verse 6 in chapter 2. Uh, well, if you go back to chapter five, uh, verse 5 there in chapter 2, it says... Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, and the son of Jer, the son of Shemiel, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away uh, with the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Uh, so these people had left Israel during the Babylonian captivity. Now understand, and that's why I gave you the time period between chapter 6 and chapter 7, of Ezra, many of them had gone back to Israel. Uh, the temple has already been rebuilt at this time. So why are there still people lingering in Persia? Uh, do you believe that God had a purpose for His people being in Babylon, His people being in Assyria, His people being in Persia? Absolutely did. And we're going to see God working through these two people. Uh, here's a, a point. Do you think God has a purpose for where we are in our life? What I mean by that, things don't always go the way we want it to. Uh, we don't always get the job we want. We don't always get the house we want. We don't always get to go where we want. But do you believe that God has a purpose for where you are and the people that are around you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And He'll use you just like He used Esther if we let Him. And I think that's the, that's the beautiful part about this story, and we're going to see it in chapter 3, is how she was usable. And every one of us can do what Esther did. Every one of us can do it. And I think that's the lesson that we need to get to. Uh, also in chapter 2, we learn of the special relationship that Mordecai and uh, Esther had. Uh, Esther was Mordecai's niece. But her mother and father had died and he had taken her as his own daughter. He was going to take care of her. And uh, so they, they had a very special relationship. And here in chapter 2, through his 
influence, through Mordecai's influence, he had pretty good influence even here in Persia, Esther actually became one of the queens. She became a maiden of the king, and she was put in a place of honor here in Persia. Now, go on to chapter 3, because chapter 3 where things really start, uh, uh, the, the plot thickens, if you will, in chapter 3. We are introduced to the man, Haman. Haman is an evil man. He's a very arrogant man. Uh, he is second in command in Persia uh, under the king at present. Uh, I said arrogant. Uh, that, that probably falls short of Haman. He was full of pride, full of pride. And he wanted to kill Mordecai. And he wanted to kill Mordecai for one reason, because Mordecai would not bow to him. <laughs> that was it. Because Mordecai would not bow to him. He wanted to kill not only Mordecai, but look down to verse 13 here in chapter 3. He actually got the king to command uh, or to make into law that all the Jews were to be exterminated. Look at verse 13. And the letters were sent by post unto all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cease to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which, which is the month of Adar, and to make the spoil of them for prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. In other words, so that they should be prepared to exterminate the Jews. Uh, you say, well, how many Jews were there? Well, we're going to see some numbers later on in this book. But we're not just talking about in one little central location. Persia went from Ethiopia all the way to India on the south. That was a large uh, country. Uh, Persia now was bigger than Babylon, was bigger than Assyria, was bigger than Egypt. They are the dominating world power at this point. Uh, and they would be until Greece would take that from them. So we're talking about Jews all over the place. Uh, have you all ever heard of anything that sounds similar to this? All the Jews being exterminated? Sounds kind of similar, doesn't it, to Hitler and what went on there? Well, that kind of gives you an idea about Haman. Uh, Haman was the one that ordered this. Just because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him, he wanted every woman, every child, every Jew to be exterminated. And he got the king to sign that over into law. You say, well, how in the world did he get the king to do that? You know, I don't, I don't really know. The Bible gives us some indication that he uh, <clears throat> told the king some leading information that the Jews would be a threat to him. And I think that's how he did it, that they would be a national security threat, so we need to get rid of them. <clears throat> now I want you to look down to chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4 is where we're going to really start reading here. This is when Mordecai asked for Esther's help. Now remember, Esther has been made a queen. And you say, well, surely she should have influence with the king. No, since, uh, since she was made king, do you know she hasn't seen the king since that day? <laughs> so it, it wasn't like a, a marriage that we think of, okay? Uh, she has not even been in... Uh, to talk to the king since the day she was made queen. But, of course, Mordecai asked her for help. Let's look at chapter 4, and we'll just start in verse 1. The Bible says, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes, and went on in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province whatsoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away a sackcloth from him. But he received it not. In fact, he would not receive it. Go down to verse 8 now. Now is where Mordecai asked her specifically for help. Verse 8 says, Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to show it to Esther. So Mordecai sent the, the copy of the law to Esther to see. 
and declare unto her this, and to charge her that she should go into the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him and for her people. Now that doesn't sound like a, a terrible request. Go and ask the king for mercy. But I want you to remember, she has not seen the king since she's become queen. And, and you all remember this from Sunday school, without an invitation from the king, if you just went in and saw the king, that was death. The king would put you to death unless he thought what you were saying was important enough that he would uh, let you speak. But you didn't go uninvited to the king. He had to invite you in. It was the death penalty if you went into him without him inviting you. And that's what she tells Mordecai. She tells Mordecai, well, you know, I've not seen him since I've been made queen. He don't even know me. Uh, and you want me to go in, in there and I'm going to die. Now I want you to look at this. Uh, you know, I thought about what Brother Brian brought in our devotional this morning. It's neat how God works. Uh, that devotional was about be, be willing to suffer for God, be willing to make a stand for God. Are you willing to do what is necessary to make a stand for the truth in your life? Now, I know we're not, any of us, the Queen of Persia in here, and we're not going to have this exact situation. But are we going to have a situation that maybe we're a little bit afraid to make the stand that we should make? Maybe it's witnessing to someone. Maybe it's standing against someone. Uh, Esther had something to think about here. She had a platform where she could go talk to the king. God had made that uh, available to her, but she knew it might mean her life. Was she willing to take that sacrifice? Was she willing to suffer for God? I want to ask you this morning, are you willing to do what is necessary? Now I want you to look down in verse 11. It says, All the king's servant, the people of the king's provinces, do know that whatsoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law, and his is to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come unto the king these thirty days. So again, I've not seen the king. He's not asked me to come see him. What would you have done? Just, just put yourself in Esther's place for a moment. You say, well, it's pretty important that the king knows. Is it important that we stand for the truth? Is it important if uh, maybe some of your family or some of your church is, uh, gets wrapped up in false doctrine? Is it important enough for you to make a stand? You say, well, I don't want to. They're probably going to hate me and say things about me and ridicule me. Is it important enough to make a stand? I've got to do like this, like this. Esther had that thought. You know, in my ministry, I've had times, and, I, and I, I do not like it as a person, I hate it, but I've had to stand against church members. I've had to stand against other pastors that were doing things uh, outside of what the Bible says. And I promise you, you will, if you haven't faced this situation, you will, where you know there's something that God wants you to do, and you're kind of scared to do it. You're kind of afraid to do it. I love the wording here. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> For if thou, this is Mordecai talking to Esther. For if thou altogether holdeth thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise, I love this, to the Jews from another place. Do you hear what he just said? God's going to save the Jews, Esther, whether it comes through you or for, through someone else. But look at this. I love this. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knowest whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Oh, I like that. God's will is going to be accomplished. Who in here does not believe that? We do believe it. Amen? God's will is going to be accomplished. But God wants to accomplish His will through me and you. Amen? Now what Mordecai is trying to tell her is God's will is going to happen. It's going to happen whether you make a stand or somebody else makes a stand. But he says, if you don't, you're going to die. In other words, if we don't make the stand that we should, then it doesn't bode well for us. We don't receive the blessings of God. Amen? In fact, the Bible says, as watchmen, 
If we do not witness, if we do not tell people that are going into false doctrine, if we do not warn them, the Bible says their blood is on our hands. Absolutely. And I love this statement. Look at the last part of that verse 14. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, I, I like this because a lot of times we think of Bible people as uh, always having a dream that God told them exactly what to do and they knew. Uh, she didn't know. She didn't have a, a vision of God saying, thou shalt go do this. She would be just like us. There's something that, yeah, it looks like I probably need to do it, but boy, it's scary. And here's Mordecai saying, who knows? Maybe that is why you were here to begin with. Why else would a Jew be lifted up as a queen in Persia? Why does God have us where He has us in our life? Now, how do we know that we're in God's will? This is great. We're the same way. We're not receiving visions from God, but we have His Word. Amen? But how are we going to know for sure that this is what God wants me to do? Folks, if you're taking a stand for what is right, no matter what you have to stand against, if you are following God's Word, then you know you're following His will. Amen? Is God's will worth it? Is God's will worth you putting your... And you know, I'm kind of like Brian. We don't have to put our lives on the line like she did. All we have to put on the line is somebody getting their lips pooched out at us a little bit or ridiculing us, saying bad names about us. Are we willing to even do that? Are we willing to endure those things for what is right? Look at verse 15. I love this. Then Esther bade them to return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night, or day. I also and my maidens will fast. What she want them to do? What is part of fasting? Pray, right? Please pray for me. Now look what it says. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. She didn't know if God was going to deliver her. But she knew it was the right thing to do. You know, when I read this, I couldn't help but think of something that happened in the book of Daniel. Y'all turn to Daniel chapter 3 real quick. Daniel chapter 3. Y'all remember? <clears throat> Y'all remember the three Hebrews and what they faced? Chapter 3, go down to verse 17. Daniel 3 and verse 17. Everybody there? If you go back to verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king of Nebuchadnezzar, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Verse 17, chapter 3. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. But now listen, verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, God is able to deliver us. And we think He's going to. But even if He don't, <laughs> we're not going to do what's wrong. Same thing that Esther said. If I perish, I perish. Folks, that takes faith. Amen? It took faith for her to walk in there. She knew what she was doing was right. Can we do what we know is right even when we're standing against others? Absolutely. You know, I've said it many times, though. Uh, a lot of Christians today, and I've seen it, I've even seen it from preachers, uh, they, they kind of live their life like water. Water goes the path of least resistance, and that's kind of how we do sometimes. There are so many preachers standing in the pulpit that tiptoe around the pulpit. They don't want to offend anyone uh, that they don't preach God's Word or they preach a watered-down version of God's Word, and it's a shame. 
It's a shame. Uh, God's men was never liked. You look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's men were never liked. Why? Because they said, Thus saith the Lord. They didn't care what others thought. Now don't get me wrong, they, they cared for the people, but they knew that God's message needed to be delivered. Folks, we need to be that people that goes back to those ways that says, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to do it God's way. That if they get mad at me, they get mad at me, but I'm going to do it God's way. We need to be those that once again stand strong for God as Esther did. Now Esther was a young lady. Uh, Esther probably at the most was 25 years old. She would be a young woman. Was not very learned as far as uh, God's Word or in religious things. And here is this woman giving us an example of how we should be in our life. You wonder why this book is in the Bible? If that's not convicting to you, I, I don't know what is. It's convicting to me to see what this young woman did. Now I want you to look on to chapter 5. I love this. Look at chapter, uh, verse 2 in chapter 5. And it was so when the king saw Esther. So now the, she's decided to go into the king. She goes into the king saying, if I perish, I perish. When the king saw the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Uh, she makes it to the king. Now here we see Esther's wisdom. She didn't come right out and say, the Jews are in danger. But the king said, what is your request? And Esther said, I, I have a banquet that I want you and Haman to come to. It's a special banquet that I just want you and Haman to come. Now by the way, in the process of this, guess what else is going on here in chapter 5? If you go down to verse 9 uh, through the end of this chapter, look at verse 14 as well. Haman makes a gallows. He makes a place to hang Mordecai. We're going to see another biblical truth in relation to this as well. But he's got everything set for the Jews to be destroyed. And by the way, that day is coming up very soon. And he's, he's going to be the one that personally watches Mordecai die on the gallows that he uh, instructed to be built. Now look at chapter 6. Things start unfolding on Haman's plan. The king started reading the history book there, or the daily log, if you will. And the king learned that way back there in chapter 1 or 2, that uh, Mordecai had actually saved the king's life, that there was a secret plot to kill the king, and Mordecai had saved him. So the king asked, well, what has been done for this Mordecai? Has any honor been uh, bestowed upon him? And uh, they said, no, not any. So I love this. Look down to verse 6 now. Everybody look at verse 6. Haman comes, uh, and I want y'all to just think about it for a minute. Y'all look up from your Bibles. Uh, Haman is just living life to the fullest now. He receives word that the queen wants to have a special banquet just with the king and him. Don't you think that made him... Oh, he was, he was on top of the world. I'm going to an exclusive party no one else gets to go to. Well, he shows up at this first banquet. There's going to be two banquets. And look at this. The king asked Haman a question. Look at verse 6. So Haman came in and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? In other words, the king says, I'm wanting to honor someone. What should be done for him, Haman? Well, who did Haman think that he was going to honor? Haman thought it was going to be him. And of course, the king wanted to honor Mordecai. Well, I love this. Haman answered the king, verse 7, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought out. Boy, he just goes on and on and on. Y'all can read verse 7, 8, 9. Uh, how wonderful it is there to see those things. <clears throat> Notice verse 11. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and it went with the ring and all that and arrayed 
Mordecai. <laughs> the first thing that Haman has to do, he has to be the one that actually promotes Mordecai. He gives him this great office and this great uh, honor. He has to be the one. Now remember, it's just the next day that Haman's wanting to hang Mordecai. Go to chapter 7. Boy, it gets better. <laughs> Here is the second banquet that Esther, that's at the first banquet, Esther said, I want to have another banquet with just you and Haman. So here they come to the second banquet. Esther's there, the king's there, Haman's there. Haman still thinks he's, uh, he's got everything in control. Now, he didn't like giving Mordecai that honor, but it's all right, he's going to kill Mordecai anyway. Now this is where she makes the request for her people. I want you to look down to verse 5. Then the king answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? This is where Esther tells the king that she is Jewish and that there is a man of your kingdom that's trying to not only kill all my people but to kill me as well. And the king says, Who in the world is this? Look down to verse 10. To make a long story short, so they hanged Haman on the gallows. The very gallows that he built for Mordecai, Haman was hung. You know, there is a biblical truth right there that you will reap what you sow. I want you all to turn real quick to Proverbs chapter 11. We've got time. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. I want you all to think about Haman for a minute before we read these verses. He was second in command. He was second in command of the largest nation in the world. Should he have not been content? But his pride was so, one man wouldn't bow down to him. Because his, his belief that God was the only one that should be bowed to. Because of his pride was such, it literally was his downfall. Look at verse 17 here in chapter 11 of Proverbs. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. When we do right, when we do right by the people around us, guess what happens to us? Now, do y'all believe that doing what God says is truly best for us? You will never be happier. You will never be happier as to when you're treating the people around you the way you should be treating them. Do you know that? You know, the Bible tells us it's more blessed to give than receive. Do you believe it? Have you experienced it? It is. Look at this truth. The merciful man doth good to his own soul. But he that is cruel troubleth what? His own flesh. You're going to reap what you sow. You know, Proverbs puts it another way. Uh, Y'all can turn back to Esther now. There's a bunch of scriptures I'd like to read here in Proverbs, but I like the one where Proverbs says, the wicked lay a trap for the righteous. <laughs> and they wind up in that very trap. The very trap that they laid for the righteous, they wind up in. And you know, you think of Haman. The very gallows that he built to hang Mordecai on was used for him to be hung. Not only him, but all of his sons and all of his house. They destroyed the house of Haman. And Mordecai was promoted. Now Mordecai is second in command of all Persia as we look to chapter 8. Now you know, with those two truths right there, that's enough for uh, this book to be in the Bible. We see Esther doing what she needs to do, even with the fear that it took. We see Haman getting what uh, he deserved, and we see the biblical concept of you reap what you sow. But there's still more in chapter 8, and I think probably the greatest thing is here in chapter 8. We're going to see how God works in lives. So Mordecai takes Haman's position, uh, and also the king granted to the Jews, now listen, this is wonderful, 
The king granted to the Jews the authority to kill anyone that tried to come against them and kill them. <laughs> so they had the authority to kill any of their oppressors. Now I want you to please look down to verse 16. So the Jews had light. This is in chapter 8. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Please look at verse 17. And in every province... That means from Ethiopia to India, all the provinces of Persia. In every province, in every city, whatsoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. Look at this. And many of the people of that land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now I want you to understand the power of this verse. In the Old Testament, being a Jew was like being a church member. We're not talking about the race of people. We're talking about the Jewish nation were God's chosen people to spread His Word to the world around them. Amen? Come on, y'all do like this. So these people became Jewish. What did they, they didn't become an ethnic Jew. But what did they do? They started practicing religiously what the Jews practiced. They took the outward sign of circumcision and then they did the things that the Jews were supposed to do. So God had spokesmen in every province, in every city, throughout Persia. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, and I think this is what the Old Testament is for, it's examples. But you look at the greatest nation that first rose up was Egypt, right? It had world influence. Did God put any people in Egypt so that they would be influenced by God? Yeah. How about all the Hebrews? How about Moses, Aaron? How about go back even before that? You got Joshua. Okay, after Egypt, there rose a nation, Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar. Did God put anybody in Babylon to be a spokesman for Him? How about Daniel? How about all the people of the captivity? You know, the Jews, and I will please get this point, the Jews saw the captivity as terrible because they had to leave their home and go to Babylon. The Jews saw the slavery to the Egyptians as terrible because they were slaves. But God was using these people to be His spokesman to the world. Do you know when things don't go quite right for us, can we not take heart that God has a purpose? God is guiding us to the people that He needs to be told about Him. Do you really believe that? Even when the bad things happen in our life, do you believe that God is guiding you? Assyria rose after Babylon. Did God put anybody in Assyria? Jonah's one, the town of Nineveh. Nahum, another one. Now we have Persia. Persia, the greatest nation, they have a world empire and they're going to reign until Greece and then Rome. Does God put anybody in Persia as His representatives? He put this little young lady in Mordecai. And from those two, <laughs> now He's got Jews in all provinces, in all cities, to be His spokesman. Do you believe that God is working in your life? Be honest. Do you believe that God is working in your life? You know, sometimes we can't see it. I believe because we don't look. We don't look. Sometimes we, as we say, we can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> if all we ever see is the things that go wrong around us, then you're never going to see God's purpose for your life. Guys, I'm saying something profound. I hope you get it. If, if all you ever see is the bad things around you, the things that don't go exactly the way you want them to go, you're never going to see God's purpose for your life. Because it is through those troubles that many times God is working. It is through those times of trial. Let me tell you in my own life, I just start thinking about the times of trial that I've had when we found out about 
uh, Carissa and the spina bifida, that was a trial. Has God ever used that? Oh, my word. <laughs> when I found out about my lupus, has God used that at all? Oh, my word, and he's still using it. Uh, when things didn't go quite right at one church and I had to go somewhere else, do you think God was working there? All the times of trial, I could see God working. But folks, if I would have gotten mad or depressed or angry and focused on the negative, I never would have got to enjoy the blessings of God using me through those moments. We need to put on the focus of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of Daniel. Because, you know, we are those people today. We are God's representatives just like they were then. You say, oh, I can't do that much for God. Here's one, one young lady and one Jew that influenced the whole world empire of Persia just by focusing on what they had to do, just overcoming their fear and doing what they had to do. Do you believe that God will use you in a mighty way if you'll just let Him? Folks, He will. He will use you. Well, I'll just quote Scripture. He will do abundantly more than you can even consider. <laughs> and He's waiting to use you and He wants to use you. But we have to start looking at the situations of life through eyes of faith. Maybe you're going through something right now. Maybe you're going through a trouble or a hardship. Maybe it's time to lean on God. Maybe you're facing a time that you know what God wants you to do, but you haven't done it yet. Uh, take some advice from Esther. You can say, if I perish, I perish. <laughs> and do what God wants you to do.